Hello out there, sports fans. Welcome to our podcast today. It's Coach EJ, the brand. It's Coach Aaron, the source. EJ, I actually got a subject I'm, I'm actually really excited to talk about. You'll probably do most of the talking, though. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm along for the ride, man. Um, really right. interested on your take, and then I'll kind of bounce in. But I'm calling this one deconstructing the five tools of baseball and what i want to do is because we hear you know hey this kid's a three tool kid or is a four tool kid you know i don't i don't know but i don't i don't hear a lot of there's a five tool kid but regardless um those in baseball understand you know what what these tools are and and they're this skill set that these athletes have to have but i'm not exactly sure everyone understands how those tools are viewed and how they manifest themselves in the game and what they should look like. And maybe even what that evolution should be over a period of time, you know, maybe, you know, what, what, how many tools should they have at middle school versus right. high school, ver you know? So right. I kind of want to dive into this. We'll, we'll go a lot of different air, probably a lot of different directions. Uh, you know, again, I'll give you my two cents, but this is, you know, more in your wheelhouse than mine. You know, I've helped develop the tools, but I actually want to look at it from the other side, from the coach's eye and not just, you know, OK, a shortstop has to run six, seven, you know, well, but also what does that look like, you know, in terms of their baseball play? So. Yeah. You know, how does that manifest itself on the field? So I want to kind of get into it. Um, but anyway, that's my opening salvo. Um, what are your thoughts? Where you want to where do you want to start on this? We're really breaking down or deep diving into these five tools people talk about and how do they apply um, in the game and how do coaches view these tools? And how are these tools, you know, analytically looked at, subjectively looked at, and how do they apply to the play on the field? And I think this is great because we're, we're, we're breaking down or deconstructing these tools to understand what it really looks like behind the scenes rather than say, here are the tools. You got to do this and do that. And right. we're really getting involved heavily into what does this really look like rather than kind of a surface kind of evaluation, as they say. Right. So EJ, let's start with the definition of the five tools. Give us a definition. Okay. Five tools of baseball. Hit, hitting, your ability to hit. Second tool, your ability to hit with power. Mm -hmm. Third tool, Arm strength, how strong is your arm? Fourth tool, how well do you play defense? Fifth tool, how fast do you run? Those are the five tools that scouts at the major league level, collegiate level, and hopefully at the high school level look at. And as I have been a USA baseball um national team coach, um, task force member, evaluator of talent. Um, we look at those tools too. So pretty much across the board, Aaron, those are the five tools. And if I had to throw another one in there, the sixth tool is your attitude. Are you a good teammate? Um, do you have a baseball IQ? Um, you know, do you buy into the team philosophy? That's the sixth tool that a lot of people really don't know about either. And that that six tools is a big deal when you're uh, constructing a clubhouse and a team to to compete. So, so those are the six tools. So we just did a podcast on um, getting to, to, to be ready to be a D1 athlete. And we actually talked about how that time clock has, has to be adjusted now. It's no longer um, the ninth grade where you say, hey, yeah, I want to be a D1 athlete and embark on that. Now we're talking 
about it being the seventh grade because there's such a disparity in the athletes who are going into college. Right. We're graduating, you know, at 17, 18 and the athletes they got to compete against are, are much older now. They're not just 20, but now they're 22, 23 with still two or three years of eligibility. Correct. So, and again, I don't know if this, this question is, is relevant, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So at the, say at that seventh grade level, okay. how many tools would you like to see a kid have if they're going to be on the trajectory to becoming a D1, a collegiate athlete? I don't even say D1, yeah, because collegiate. just collegiate, because all of it's highly competitive now. And we talk about that in the podcast. <laughs> we sure do. <laughs> um, you know, so, I mean, as a parent or as a coach, because I know you get these athletes and just like I get these athletes like, oh, OK, I'm seeing something here. You know, right. uh, you, you you know what when you see it. And, right. and so maybe what's that aha moment to say, you know what? I got something here. Right. You know, are they displaying two tools? Are they displaying three tools? Are they are they really um, an outlier for their age group in one tool? Um, what are you seeing? What would you like to see? You know, just probably from your your main, you know, not your super yeah. gifted athlete, but just your mainstream kid who comes in, who, hey, we can build this kid into the model that we're looking for. Right. Because that's really most of us. We're talking to mere mortals. We're not talking. Right. We're talking about the average Joe guy. Yes. Okay. So two tools. Two. I say two. Um, and the reason why I say that is because I think we can develop a third one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Say like the kid's got a really good arm. That's a tool. And he's a really good defender. That's a tool. But he's an average runner and he's an average hitter. And those aren't tools yet. The power tool, Aaron, by the way, I mentioned, I don't even look into that because that as a tool that is acquired later on. I believe it potentially has what I call a potential label. I don't, I don't use that tool very much and colleges, the guy's got power, but the bat and everything like that, it's changed that. I think the power tool is later in pro ball personally. That's my opinion. Okay. I think you see guys hit 20 home runs in college or 18. They think that's power. No, it's not. I put a wood bat in the hand and now it's eight. Yeah. <laughs> so. Just I, I throw out the power tool. So I need to see at least two tools and let's develop a third tool. Okay, so if now, I see I have the good arm or a good, uh, you know, good defender and he's the average runner, we can help that average runner because maybe their their gate or whatever, you know, you, you, you know this better than I do. is just not functioning right. And well, we can make that guy a little bit better. So let's look at you said the defensive tool, because that's something that's a little more subjective. Yes. So. You know, at the seventh grade, what are they doing that tells you, hey, this kid has a tool? Do you see what I'm saying? Because we yes. talk, I talk about this a lot of time. You can be successful at lower levels doing things incorrectly. Right. So what are you looking for that really says, hey, that's a defensive tool for a younger athlete? Because something that they do at the seventh, eighth grade may not play right. in high school because size of the field gets bigger, you know, right. the, the right. game gets faster, all of those sorts of things. So what are you looking at that transfers to the next level? Yeah. Each level, right? High school, college, for, for instance, when can they catch the ball? What I look for is when they play catch, like they catch the ball and they catch in their pocket and they transition into a throwing hand and it's very smooth and it's very relaxed and it's controlled. If I see that, that's a start of a defensive tool. That's a start of it. It doesn't mean they have a defensive tool, but they can catch the ball properly and they're catching their pocket every time. And when they go to transfer into their hand, it's not like they're always double clutching. They're just, it's a smooth transition into a a movement pattern to throw the baseball key, a movement pattern to throw the baseball because you can teach a movement pattern, but they're doing it naturally. Catch, transition, move their feet, good, good arm, right? So they're doing that. That's just catching. Now you get them out to the position, the same thing. It looks the same. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're in infield. Looks the same. Catch, transfer, good movement pattern. Outfield. They read the ball. Jump, get a jump, turn the right way, get their feet in correct position, catch the ball, throw it. So I hit the ball on, I hit the ball on the ground to an outfielder. They can come in, catch it, move into a crow hop fast, and transition with the glove to hand transfer and the throw. So that's when I know. I go, there's a tool there. Mm -hmm. How efficient will that tool be? Let's go try it when uh, a person is running against them or it's live. Let's see if that actually is a tool when you play it live. So one of our most storied um, baseball players that we've shared, we were actually lucky enough to get at the eight, you know, at that sixth, seventh grade age. OK, and now I guess he's on his way of retiring. And we were yes. just talking about him earlier this week, Brandon Crawford. Right. What did you see in Brandon Crawford at that age? What tools was he displaying? Oh. And, and, and I, I'm sure it was defense. <laughs> okay. I'm going to tell you. What did his defense look like? Did it look like what you're describing? Or it looked like that to a T. And I was like, that, that, that and that, the smoothness and the actions, and you just had some actions. I go, well, those are different. Like, you know, and he knew they needed to get better too. And I was like, wow, this guy, this guy's different. He's an outlier. He's there's something different about his school. Is he and he also has a sense. Here's another thing. When I say defensive tool, there is a sense of like I can react or I anticipate, keyword, anticipate where I think that ball's going, and I see plays ahead of plays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about a defensive tool, I'm talking about all of this stuff here within that, not just, okay, catch, throw, that's good enough. I'm yeah. talking about IQ, sense of like anticipation where that ball is going to be, bad hop uh, reactions, and just how they move their body right. fluidly yeah. as an athlete. And I like that you said that because I, I'll always hear these parents come back from a showcase or a tryout. And they'll always say, he caught every ball hit to him. And I always have to say, it's not him catching each ball, mm -hmm. making the throw. It's how they have approached that catch and made the throw. Because there's a certain expectation at a certain level that you should be catching and throwing the ball. Right, exactly. But you have to understand Good coaches are looking at the process of how you do that. It's not just the completion. You, do you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. And and that's what you're talking about when you're talking about identifying a yeah, this particular tool. And I want parents to really understand that. The, the completion of the play is only one part of the success. But when you're talking about evaluating an athlete, and talking about where their skill set is at, it's the process that they go through. Because if, for instance, in track and field, you can have at younger ages, kids who are just physically stronger and they're bigger and they'll outrun kids. Okay, those kids won the race, but if their head is way back and their arms are flailing, their process is really screwed up. And that, mm -hmm. and as a track coach, I know that process ain't going to play at the next level. That process isn't going to win at the next level. So I may opt to take this kid who took second or third, who's only a couple of steps behind him, but doing things, doing the process more correctly. Right. Yeah. I as, as a coach. Now I've got to do a lot of work to correct that kid who won doing everything incorrectly and mm -hmm. have to maybe t have him unlearn some bad habits where I can take a kid who's doing 70% of the things correctly, but may not be there physically yet, or may need, or may just have some tweaking to do. Right. right. So maybe that's a, an analogy that might strike home with you guys a little bit better. You know, it's not what your eyes are always, you know, telling yeah. you who won the race, who made the play, who hit the ball, but the process to that success. Right. 
Right. And I, I think that's what, you know, a lot of people don't understand about when you talk about the five tools is there's a story within the story. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of times that gets lost in translation. And I hear that often. Well, they did everything perfect at the showcase or at the yeah. camp or in the game. They did it perfect, you know, and you can see it. Look at the numbers and stuff like that. I go, OK, um, what kind of ball was it that was hit to them? Was it hard? Was it soft? Uh, was it average? Who was the runner? Was the runner running really fast? Mm-hmm. Um, was it to their left? Was it to their right? Was it at them? How what, how, how difficult was the play? Mm-hmm. So you start taking all of that stuff to evaluate, does this player have a defensive tool? Yeah. All that stuff I mentioned. Yes, yes. Part of having yes. a tool. You've got to have those things to have a tool. OK, you can't just say, oh, he's got a tool because he can catch the ball and he can transition it What if this player only can only catch a ball right at them. That's not a defensive tool to me. That player can make a routine play. OK, at them right at him. What about if it's two steps to the right or three steps to the left? And it goes back to speed. Does a player's speed translate into the, on the field? Like the guy can be a six five runner, but he gets terrible jumps and he's all awkward. He gets there too fast. He's he has no body control. He doesn't know how to get their glove prepared properly. Now, yeah, he's a fast runner, but he doesn't have a defensive tool. Just because you're fast doesn't mean you have a defensive tool. You see what I'm saying? So take it from a guy. <laughs> <It's so funny. laughs> because when I started playing ball again. Uh-huh. Uh, college, semi-pro. I was a six-one, six-flat, sixty-yard dash guy. Right. I played outfield better as a 10, 11, 12, 13 year old than I did as a twenty-four year old. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, I could get to the ball, but you know, my whole depth perception and everything was all off. Right. So here I go, high ball, you know, five stories up, and I can't track it. But at a 12, 13 year old, I could, you know? And it, it's just funny you mentioned that because it just brought back some embarrassing <laughs> <laughs> memories for me. Oh, my gosh. Like, God, yeah, I sucked, you know? <laughs> but, but again, it's about, yeah. but it's funny because. A ball to my left, ball to my right, Mm -hmm. diving catch, boom, no problem. Right. You know? So, again, how is that speed transferring? And anyway, just a side note, but it was just something that (laughs) that, that, made me cringe. (laughs) (laughs) Because I was that guy. But you're right. You know, it's it's about usable speed. It's about usable speed. And, again, you know, in the speed aspect, you have to have a lot of plus speed to be successful and still make mistakes in baseball at a high right. level. Oh, absolutely. You need to have definitely. I was lucky enough to be that guy when it was baseball. Right. But I can tell you, I didn't get the best jumps. And I had to practice on reading pictures and, you know, to really utilize my speed a lot better. But I see that with a lot of younger athletes. They're fast, but they're making a lot of mistakes in reading the pitcher anticipating where the ball is going to come off the bat, all of those sorts of things and using their speed where there's kids who are two steps slower, boom, boom, boom. They're on it because they are doing that math in their head. Yes. And, and Aaron, I hear this a lot with college coaches and even professional guys too, is that, you know, they're going to find the fastest guy and put him in center field Mm -hmm. because of the, the ground that they have to care cover number one, but you said it. What if they don't get a good read? Their speed can overcome it. Yeah. See, so when you talk about the speed tool, there is a plus speed tool, plus plus speed tool um, that is like that six to six three runner that they can put in center field mm-hmm. over the six five six 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 guy. Because even the guy who runs six five six six, he's really fast. He gets good jumps. Mm-hmm. There's something different about a 6-0 runner versus a 6-5 runner. There's and you know this better than anybody. So when they start talking about these tools and, and people understanding, they need to understand about these one-tenth, two-tenths, three-tenths of running speed is a big deal to a lot of these guys at certain positions, mm-hmm. you know. 
So uh, understand, you know, about this tool set and what does it mean to you, you know? Um, and I think um, we're taking a deep dive and breaking down these tools um, is important, is really important. So just to, to kind of recap on the speed tool, because we kind of just glossed over right. a couple of things. So then basically when you're looking at a speed tool, it's not just the flat out speed. That's the raw speed. Okay. That's, that's raw speed. Indicator. Yes. Yes. So now we're talking about maybe how they clear the bat, how they clear the box mm -hmm. after they make contact with the ball. Right. What's their approach if they've got to take two? What's that path? What's that route? How efficient right. that is? Mm -hmm. Do they have the ability to reaccelerate to take three? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is their sliding mechanics like? Right. right. It all plays up. First dive, feet first dive. Do they right. know how to anticipate that, you know, those things properly? Then when you're talking about speed, I guess, what are their jumps like? What oh, are absolutely. their speed offs like? You know, are they heads up guys who, again, anticipating where the ball is going to be so they don't get caught in the pickle? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I'm just going through scenarios and things that I had to learn to be able to utilize my speed. I mean, is that what you guys are looking at on the backside, too, besides, OK, this kid's a burner? Because you can only use so much of that. Right. You could have said any better. Um, all those things that you said are correct about, you know, this speed tool. Because the guy can be really fast. Yeah, he's got speed. But is it speed that you can apply in the game? Right, right. Getting a good jump. does Because the guy can be really fast. What if he's not a good start? Like he picks up his speed later in the run. Right. Well, what if he's trying to steal a base? Yeah. And, and a good example is Ricky Henderson, yeah. who was fast, but he was fast right from the start. Right. He stole so many bases is that he could get the top speed really fast. Another guy, Vince Coleman, could yeah. get the top speed really fast. And that's why they stole all these bases. And versus a guy that is just as fast as them, if not faster, and they couldn't steal bases. I saw that guy, too. I saw that guy, a guy named Keith Tool Cool Thomas, <laughs> was a 5960 guy, couldn't steal a base. We throw him out every time because he never got a good jump and couldn't get the top speed. By the time he got halfway there, he was like at top speed, but the ball was there. Yeah. And you know? it's funny you mentioned that because when I talk to athletes about speed, and and the, the 60 is such a misnomer. It, it does oh, such a disservice to, to baseball it is a disservice. because of its application to the game. And right. I said, baseball speed is about your ability to accelerate. Mm, yes, sir. That's it. If you're talking about usable baseball speed, it's your ability to accelerate. So if I'm a scout and I'm wanting to quantify if this kid has a speed tool, it's not going to be based on a 60 yard dash. Right. It's not. I'm going to be looking at his acceleration mechanics through at least maybe 30 yards. Mm -hmm. How does mm -hmm. this kid get up to speed? That's going to tell me the playing speed that he's going to be able to use or the right. potential playing speed he's going to be able to use. So, you know, this is coming from a speed guy. Okay. That, to me, that 60 just doesn't really matter a whole lot. I mean, I guess it's like the it's like you know throwing ninety. Yeah, you got to run a certain time to get your foot through the door so that they'll consider you. Yeah. But in terms of what makes you effective ball player, I don't think that's in an indicator. And and I'm going to go off on the tangent and say I agree with you 100 percent there. And coaches are timing guys when they hit the ball. You said it. How do they get out of the batter's box? usable speed when they hit the ball and how they gather and run down the first base line. Yes. On a ball hit on the infield, how fast are they running through first base? And then also uh, another thing that a lot of people don't understand about that speed tool is when they get a hit, that base hit, what's their turn time running full speed. They touch the bag. What's their turn yes. time. And then when they hit extra base, a base hit, what's their time to second? What's their time to third? That's why they have these splits on their on their stopwatches. Oh, he was there at a second, and he got there at third, and they can go back and look at that. Well, coaches are looking at that at that now. 
And yeah, because there's an efficiency that you have to have to be able to take two and take three. And if that time gets slower and slower, it doesn't matter. And even though that might be 60 yards, it's not 60 yards straight. Right, right. And, you know, it's kind of funny you said this. I was watching a video on one of the players that you and I share, and I saw this player hit the ball to right center field, and I saw him get the proper turn, pick up the ball inside corner of the base, and then when he saw that he was ready to go to third, just before the bag, he just took off to third and i saw whoa look at that that reminded me of Deion sanders when we were playing in candlestick one day and he hit the ball down the right field line and willie mcgee went down the line cut the ball off and lobbed it in robbie thompson and i'm like going why why did he get rid of it fast well by the time Deion sanders got between first and second he was already on third that's yeah. why he got the ball and threw it, threw, lobbed it back into robbie because he said no chance this guy's acceleration speed around the bases is incredible and that's what coaches look for also so when you said that i was like going boy he's hey he's checking all the boxes aaron is checking all the boxes now he's talking about what coaches look for when they look for those five tools how does it apply to baseball do they have acceleration do they get good jumps that's a speed tool to me cool Let's go to um, we did defense, we did speed. Let's let's do arm speed. Yes. Arm strength, I guess. Right, right. Most, most people are gonna call it velocity. Right. So there's some parameters. I mean, you 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 throw everybody in right field and you have them throw the ball from uh right field to third base, and they're they're looking for a miles per hour rating, right? Mm -hmm. So I look at that and it's usually over 85. 85 miles per hour is considered a plus arm. In in the infield, same thing. Okay, consider a plus arm. And that's for a high school athlete. That's right. That's for high school athletes. I'm just going to start there. As you go up the levels, like 90 right. and 95, et cetera. Now, what would you what would you look at as again? We're, we're talking about this beginning development. What right. about a seventh grader? And I think this is important. So yeah, James Darnell. <laughs> James Darnell. Another guy we had. So at, at a young age, and I saw him at nine. So I kind of had a feeling <laughs> of James at nine that he was guys pretty different because of his throwing motion was so good. But he got the ball and his arm speed, man, his arm speed to get the ball and bam. I'm like, whoa, that's different. So what I looked at with my eye was the fact that how fast he could catch the ball and then get his circle moving on the backside. This arm was moving quickly. And when he threw it, the ball had carry. It, it didn't like go there and drop. It was actually accelerating. I'm going, this is a nine, 10 year old kid. And then <laughs> when he got in seventh grade, I was like, oh my goodness, hey. that's a plus varsity arm already. Now this might be a stupid question, but is is a high degree of velocity going to be apparent with that type of throw at that age? Or does the velocity come more from the strength? You know what I'm saying? I know a kid can have a strong arm at that age, but I'm just saying, are you, if you see a kid who can do that, but maybe the velo isn't there, but those underlying mechanics and processes there, is that still something that says, okay, this is a possible plus? It could be a possible plus, just depending on how the strength and the, the the athlete grows and how how efficient they become. Are they still efficient? Usually, if a kid is early and he has good throwing mechanics, and I see the ball spinning right, I know that that, that yeah, that's going to carry. And that's, that's what I'm getting at because yeah. I you know we've had hitting classes, we've had fielding classes, and I'm looking at these kids throw, and I'm like, this kid can't throw, right? <laughs> it, you know. Yeah, and I'm I'm going to tell you about this throwing thing too. Go ahead with your thought, and I want to. And, and so that's why I'm saying, you know, that goes back to parents making sure these kids learn these processes and not worry about the outcome so much because you might have a slight kid, but like you said, if he's getting that quick delivery and you're starting to see that spit proper spin on the ball and there's no deceleration, you know, over a certain. All right distance then you're probably doing all right, right. because that kids are going to grow they're going to get stronger you can do strength right. you know what i'm saying but yeah. the underlying thing again i go back to my 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 sprint analogy if the underlying mechanics are there 
and it's just a matter of a lack of horsepower, well, mother nature and conditioning can take care of that. Right. If the kid is, if his mechanics are bad, and yeah, he may have a rocket arm at the seventh grade, but if his mechanics are bad, how much of that is going to continue to carry? Uh, it won't. You know, I, I, I've said this, you know, I've been in, in baseball training development since 1990. And what I've, I've found out, uh, and I was playing then, is that if I could teach a kid how to throw at eight and nine, they're not going to have problems later. And I think it's so such a, a big issue. Teach kids how to throw properly at eight and nine. Um, and even at, at 10 can be late. 11 can be late. 12 can be late. When the kid picks up a glove, puts a glove on, and they go for their first throw, teach them the proper mechanics, the wrist action, the arm action, all that stuff. Because if you don't, then the field's going to catch up to you. Mother nature is going to catch up to you with bad mechanics and throwing. And when you first so much that that you can do. And when you first put that glove on the kid, what are most people looking for? They're looking for them to catch the ball. Right. <laughs> they're not looking at that they're other. Not, they're not looking at the throw. That's the success. That's the visual success. Right. That's the win. Yeah. They might get the ball to you, but it might be so wonky in any other way unless you really have a trained eye and understand what that process should look like, that probably is overlooked quite a bit. Because again, you have this false sense of success because, oh, the kid got the ball to me. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. But you dropped the ball. That's the failure. You, do you understand what I'm saying? So our focus um, is probably, is, it has to be on both processes, not just, the one that looks like the success. Right. And along those lines, Aaron, the player who you're you're playing with at a young age, they're copying what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So if you have a funky, wonky <laughs> throwing motion, they're probably doing the same thing what they <laughs> see. I'm a young kid. I don't know. I mean, right. six, seven, eight, and they're looking at that going, oh, Mom, dad, throw that way. I guess that's the right way. <laughs> condition as kids, listen to your parents, do what your parents do. And they're doing the same thing. And I remember a coach years ago, uh, and he said this to me. And I love this, what he said to me. He goes, you know, I try to play catch the way that you're teaching us in the coaching clinic. So my kid knows how to play catch correctly or how to throw correctly. He said, I try to catch with two hands. I try to the arm action you showed us. And talk. I try to do what you taught me so my kid can come, become a better thrower. And I remember that. I remember this kid's kid, um, this young man's, uh, this, this gentleman's kid. And he was a very good thrower of the ball because the father or the mother in, in, in both cases were teaching them properly. I've always said this. I thought girls throw better than guys at an early age because they're taught better. And there's a, a, um, there's a degree of importance on not only catching, but throwing and throwing properly. And the classes we've taught over the years in softball and baseball at the same age group, whether it was softball, yes. The girls class, can always throw. The girls were way better than the guys at right. 13. And, and I was like going, they just have better mechanics. They were taught oh. better at an early age. And that's why they throw the ball much better. They throw the ball way better than the guys do at an early age. And I've always said that about uh, softball players versus boys at certain ages. They threw the ball better. So it could be a compliment if someone says you throw like a girl. <laughs> Absolutely. It sure can. <laughs> I'm like, you throw like a girl? Well, that's pretty good to me. <laughs> hey, I'll take it. Um, okay. So now moving moving on to speed right. or arm speed, arm velocity, arm strength mm -hmm. at the higher level. So you, you talked about, you know, they put you out in right field right. and they, they, you know, give you a, a velo reading. Right. Now, right. what are some of the other things? They're probably looking at trajectory. Definitely trajectory yeah. and carry. Trajectory yeah. and carry is what they're well, looking for. Explain carry, because we talked about carry again in the right. infielding, but I really want you to give another definition or repeat that definition of carry on a ball. Because I don't think 
people understand what that really means? Um, Terry would be when the ball comes at you and it's still maintaining some sort of velocity going to the base, whether it's when it's going there, it skips and accelerates to the fielder or the third baseman in the case if the kids are in right field, or if the ball is thrown on a line and it stays on that same line all the way to third base. That's like carry arm strength. They look for that, how the ball comes out of the hand and it just keeps on moving. It doesn't like die or you right. can see the ball peter out. Cell or peters out, right? Yeah. But this ball is accelerating and it, when it gets to the fielder, it's got bam, pop to it. It's got this pop and you go, whoa, that now that's arm strength. That's a plus tool right there. That ball has carry and it has the velocity. And that's what they're looking for. Whether you catch a fly ball or ground ball and get rid of it, they look for that. Because at the end of the day, when a guy's trying to go first to third, you're an outfielder, you got to show that kind of velocity to throw that guy out. And so um, that's important about carry. The ball just has life to it that is just constant life and it gets to the base quickly. I like that term you use, life. The ball has life to it. Yes. Good. All right. So moving on. Um, we'll go to hitting because right. we'll come back to hitting power. I know that's related, but I remember you were talking about that being something that is not as big a factor for probably the younger athletes as it is to when you're starting to get post collegiate. So, right. Uh, let's go to hitting. And I, I, I wanted to talk about hitting because we've also had some shared athletes who have been evaluated recently. Right. <laughs> and, and, you know, we've got some, you know, gotten some pretty good insights and just some good verbiage on how coaches at the D1 level are evaluating, um, you know, kids hitting. And again, it's not just about, hey, the kid hit the ball, <laughs> you, know, hey, right. even, you know, because, again, I think the low bar for a lot of us, you know, growing up was make contact. Right. But there's a ter certain type of contact. Right. And right. it's the approach to how you made that contact. Right. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned something in one of our, I think one of the earlier podcasts about, okay, a, co a collegiate guy can have 20 home runs, but put a wood bat in his hand and it's now eight. Yeah. <laughs> so, and we, you, you use the term a lot. I like, hey, that bat doesn't play at the next level. So let's get into that. Let's get into that, the, the yeah. hitting tool. Yeah. So if we started, you know, and, and, and just kind of go along with me here, if we start at a younger level, like seventh grade and, and I look at it and if the kid's in the ball in the barrel in the sweet spot consistently, I go, well, that's really good. So in batting practice, they're hitting the ball in the sweet spot off the tee sweet spot. So that checks a box. Okay. Sweet spot allow off the tee. Sweet spot of BP. Okay. Game. Okay. Inner squad game. Boy, he's getting a lot of hits. Looks good. Now all of a sudden we get umpires, teams are playing scoreboard, fans yelling, doing the same thing. I go, hmm, that's consistency. That gets overlooked. The, the kids consistent off the tee, consistent in BP, consistent in the game, consistent inner squads. Like that. Okay. That that's alerts me this kid possibly has a hit tool let's see where that goes in a statistical manner over a long period of time during the season oh it does it matches up oh that's a star of the hit tool at a younger age okay now we get out and we start playing high school ball and you start to see them face better pitching OK, and they're hitting better pitching. They're hitting on the sweet spot. And all of a sudden, oh, wow, that looks good. OK, it's consistent. It's consistent. The average is high. Oh, he can hit. Oh, check off the boxes. Now we go to summer, summertime, better pitching, throwing harder. Is he doing the same things he did at seventh grade, eighth grade, high school varsity? He's doing those things. This kid, this kid has a hit tool in the summer. Now I go, hmm, is that a hit tool that relates to college? So let me stop you there. Another one of our shared athletes um, had a, a storied major league career, 
probably one of the, the the funnest guys I've ever worked with, Chris Carter. Oh, the animal. <laughs> one of the best hitters that come out of the Bay Area. Absolutely. Um, Hands down. Yeah. Uh, in, in quite a while. And and so I started working with Chris, I think, ninth grade, 10th grade, maybe. I think earlier than that, because I, I had him at 11. Okay. And he came to you right after... Right after that, a year later at 13, probably. So what were you seeing in Chris at that point? <laughs> well, first of all, um, <laughs> he was in attack mode right from the get-go, from the first swing. His mindset, when he got on the tee, it wasn't a warm-up. <laughs> it, it wasn't, a, you know, like kids, I got to get loose off the tee. Right, right, right. Uh-uh, uh-uh. He had already stretched. He already swung the bat itself physically, probably 50 times I even <laughs> hit in the ball. So the first swing off the tee, I heard this crack and I went, whoa, what is that? And he, it's like, and all of a sudden he just locked in. When I say locked in, locked in like a big leaguer. And I was like, this kid's like 11, 12. What's going on here? And, he <laughs> just, and I was playing still. So I, I, I could relate to what he was doing. And I was going, whoa, that's different. That's way different. He was just locked in mentally and he was ready. See, he was prepared before we even started off the tee. So he started hitting the ball off the tee and all of a sudden it was starting to go to the back of the cage on a line. And I went, whoa, wait a minute. That's off the tee. And I'm not talking about like two or three. I'm talking about like 10 to 20, 30 in a row. Bam, bam, bam. And I went, oh, that's different. And I said, okay, he, okay, he's off the tee, ain't moving. Let me, let me throw him some BP. Man, I started throwing some BP and I just heard this loud crack. Bam, bam. And this, just like off the tee. And I was like, man, this dude is like, is he, he having a good day? You know, like, he having a good day? No, that wasn't a good day. That was him every day. He would, just hit so much and it was off the sweet spot. So the swing was developed. It was developed on one. He had great balance, great balance, yeah. good body control. When he hit the baseball, he hit through it and he never hit at the ball. He hit through the ball a lot. Yeah. And, and when he hit it, it made a different sound and you heard it. You heard him uh, when he hit it, you know, and that, that triggered me at a young age. So he started just doing this against every type of competition. That's a hit tool. And you know what happened? That's the first guy I said had a hit tool of power. Yeah. I mean, I remember doing a showcase, showcase workout at a park in uh, at Dabla Vista Ballpark here in the Bay Area. And um, 20 scouts came out. 20, 25 scouts, cross checkers, local guys, everybody. And I was still in batting practice. Had Aaron, I had about 60 brand new baseballs. At the end of the workout, I only had 20 left. <laughs> he had left the ballpark 40 times. I'll never it's the, the the best hitting display I ever saw. He left the ballpark, left field, center field, right field, just hitting missiles. And after about that, they go, I go, you guys seen enough? Yeah, we're good. <laughs> he goes, I'll hit some more if you want me to. I'm like, I'm more baseballs, Chris. <laughs> but that, that's what I'm talking about, man. That's, that's a typical Chris Carter. <laughs> yeah, it, it, right there, right? He had a, that's a hit tool. That's it. He's on the sweet spot hitting the ball with backspin perfectly to left, center, right. And it's consistent. That's a hit tool. So you look at that and you go, wow, oh, that's a true hit tool. That's what they're talking about. And when you looked at his swing, he was in correct positions, correct setup, launch, initiation, contact, finish. He was just had him dialed in against all types of pitching, you know, and it took a lot of repetition and he was able to do that. And so when I see that, I kind of evaluate you know, when I evaluate hitters, I compare them to Chris all the time because that is the ultimate hit tool right there. He could hit. And so when people say, oh, man, he could really hit, I go, hmm, interesting. No, that guy could really hit. What, what is your son doing or your daughter doing that we can make a little bit better? So I start going, breaking down the mechanics. And the college coaches do the same thing. They got tons of video now. High school coaches got tons of video. 
and you can break down the mechanics and see if this player could possibly make an adjustment to have a hit tool. Like this is a flaw in their swing. Can they adjust now and do that in the game and take that for consistently? Keyword, consistent C, hit the ball in the barrel. Can they make an adjustment? That's how you can acquire a hit tool, okay? You may not have it, but you can acquire it through work, uh, training and stuff, and can you handle it in the game? If you can translate that, it can become a hit tool if you're the average Joe. Or if you're above average, you maybe you have it. Mm. So in the era of, <clears throat> of metrics and all that stuff now, <clears throat> right? What how is that playing with identifying a tool? Um, or is it, you know, is <clears throat> Is there, you know, spurt certain if we're trying to quantify it, which everyone always tries right. to just quantify everything, right. are right. there certain spin rates at certain ages at you know, yeah, that <laughs> that people are, are are following? Because you know, again, can a kid achieve the right spin rates with an improper process? So right. And and the reason why I say this is because, again, I can have a kid run a fast time, right? But if his process is wrong, I know it's not gonna, he's not gonna race at the next level. To take your analogy, right? So, and I know people are looking for, hey, what is that thing that I need that's mm -hmm. gonna tell me, hey, my kid is doing good and right. they're doing well, and we always run to the the analytics right so i'm just curious can the analytics also be a little deceiving in this aspect well let me give you let me give you some numbers i i um i was talking to a college coach and what they were doing at batting practice i'm just going to start there because i think this is important everybody wants to play at the next level get beyond high school and play in college i just want to throw these numbers out there so they go to batting practice they turn the track man on in their stadium mm-hmm um, they set up a couple machines, fastball machine, slider machine, and then they have a reaction machine to where you don't know what's coming. OK, so what they look at is that is this player and what they're trying to get their players to do is hit the ball at 95 miles per hour. OK, between the launch angle of 15 and 30, I think he said 30 degrees. OK, um, zero degrees. Remember, zero degrees basically is a line drive, basically one degree is line drive. So. <laughs> If they're hitting it at 95 miles per hour at 15 to 31 degrees, they're at their ballpark, they're beating the outfielders. So the, the ballpark plays a major role in that too. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? It's not yeah. just like, okay, here's the number. This is applied at their ballpark. If mm -hmm. they get the player swinging 95 off the exit velocity speed of the ball hitting the bat, and it's at 15 to 30 degrees at their ballpark, they're beating the outfielders. OK, so understand that that that's related to the ballpark. So when you thought, talk about analytical, analytical um, parameters and stuff, um, I think parents don't get locked into like, oh, well, it hits it at that miles per hour. But what if the ballpark is huge mm -hmm. and you hit at 30 degrees as an out? So you, you got to adjust down a little bit, you know, so what I always tell people Hit the ball in the sweet spot as much as possible and hit as many line drives as possible. If you do that, you're going to be just fine at any level. And I, I, and it's pretty simple. Don't get caught up in like, well, he swings at this much, but it was hit at 45 degrees. It means nothing. So I think that's important, Aaron, is that, you know, understand hitting line drives, hitting a ball with backspin on a line or on the ground hard or in the air at a trajectory where the outfielders, the infielders can't catch it on a line, it's the best way to train a hitter, period. And, um, you know, like you said, mother nature and all that stuff, it helps them as they develop if they're a younger player. But teach, teach a correct swing to where the player can do it in the game conditions. That's the key right there, doing it in the game. You can have a good cage swing, Aaron. 
a good practice swing, but you get in the game, you, you something happens mentally. You know, I go to the six tool I talk about. Can a player handle it mentally? You know, can they handle failure? I think part of, of deconstructing these five tools we talked about is can you handle when things aren't going well? So oh, it's called performance. <laughs> yes. Yes, performance. Yeah. Called performance. You know, in track and field, we used to have what we called workout kings. Mm. Guys okay. Run the intervals and run the times and run everyone into the dirt. And then when they only have to do it once on a Saturday when the gun goes off, mm -hmm. they're never they're not to be found. So, you know, I love that. Otherwise you got to be a gamer. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, you know, that, that kind of, you know, talks about those tools, Aaron, about all those tools. And in the power tool, like you discussed, is a tool that I think is acquired later. I don't see a lot of players with power tools immediately. And I've seen, I've seen just over the past 10 years of athletes I've had, maybe two guys with a power tool, like a projectable power tool. Um, and it, it plays. Um, the first player, um, and, and I think back Chris Carr, cause he had a natural power tool, but from the time Chris left us and stuff, two players, we have one right now that potentially has a power tool that we share. And then, um, years ago, there's another guy who just had it and, you know, it, 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 it worked at the next level, but, uh, yeah. So I think the power tool is something that, um, has a lot to do with the development and strength of a player. Yeah, Brett Wallace was another kid, a guy that comes uh, in. He also had a little uh, Brett uh, Wallace could mash. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. He could hit. He was one of the best hitters. hitters. These guys are far and few between, and I don't think people realize or appreciate, you know, oh, my kid hit so many home runs. It's like, yeah, okay, well, mm -hmm. that. what was the pitching like? What was the field like? You know? And how did that ball move? So, there, yeah, there's some things that you're talking about when you're talking about deconstructing these things that, you know, in all honesty, unless you're a coach and have been coaching for a while or and have developed the eye and seen enough iterations of what these things should look like, um, you're not going to be <clears throat> qualified to to always speak upon. Right. And, and so you got to kind of, you know, again, yeah, there's politics and baseball and tryouts and all the rest of that stuff, right. but you got to kind of understand that you may not be seeing what they're seeing. And, yeah. and, and so part of what reason why we're doing this is so that you guys can understand, Hey, these are some of the things that these coaches are looking for. And regardless of whether it's, there's success on the end of that activity or failure, what does that process look like? Mm -hmm. Like and, that. And I think that's where the emphasis needs to be, especially for these young athletes, if you're talking about developing these tools. Some of it might happen naturally. Some, it, some of it you may have to construct. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but... Um, understand um you can't always believe your lion eyes <laughs> <laughs> true so true yeah uh i think the key word you said aaron uh, i love what you said the process you know that's that's a lot to do with managing your athlete and understanding that it takes time for your players to develop so well said my man well said there we have it. Destruct, deconstructing the five tools. With that said today, Aaron, that ends our podcast. And uh, again, this is Coach Eric Johnson, the brand. And this is Coach Aaron Thigpen, the source, reminding you guys to hit that like or dislike button. Even better, send a comment, question, and uh, let us know how we're doing. We'll see you.